Just be you, Mike. That's what, that's what I always liked about you. Just be you. Oh, that's worked out so well for me in the past. Let's keep doing that. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Pottywood. Pottywood interviews. Uh, our last one with uh, owner Tukel has gone really, really well. Uh, and it went a lot longer than what made air. We'll put it that way. Uh, so naturally, we, we wanted to carry on with some debut guests, and uh, we've got a real treat today. But before I introduce our guest, obviously my co-host for this week is Joe Parker. Joe, how are you? I'm very good. I, you know, I'm pretty premium, like our guest is today. But um, no, I'm doing all good, doing great. Oh, you um, total sucker! <laughs> after the Batman and Robin, I need to, I need to get something back. Okay, like this is going to be a fun-filled episode. Oh yes, true. We did throw you straight in, straight to the wolves for your first uh, episode. What killed the dinosaurs? The Ice Age. Uh, which is all available on YouTube. If you haven't seen it yet, go back and see it. It's doing really well at the moment. Um, mm. Okay, uh, a bit of history uh, about our guest this week. Uh, I first met our guest in 2014. It was the first time I went to the actual Warner Brothers Burbank uh, studio. So I'm walking around there like a total big kid because I finally made it to a studio. And I, I met um, Mike Deesa, who is our guest this week. Hello, Mike. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you doing? It's good to see you. Very well. You know, it has, it has been since 2014, since we actually were both in the same vicinity. It's wow. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Not counting the hour and a half we talked before the show. Sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. right. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. We're going to do a little bit of a, a kind of biographical talk for your career journey, uh, pulling out some of the projects that you've worked on and uh, just Getting to find out more about you, more about your career, where you've got coming up, and all that other stuff, which is a great thing to do in an era of strikes, because many people know. <laughs> but oh. we'll do our best. Uh, so uh, I guess we kind of, if we're going to start off with yourself, I hear that uh, you're a Rock Island boy, correct? No, I'm from I'm from the south side of Chicago. Uh, I was really? born right by Marquette Park, which was the murder capital of the United States when I was growing up. Yeah. No, I I would have loved to. Trust me, I would have loved to have been from Rock Island. Sounds like a great place where nobody shot at you, but that is not where I was raised. That, well, you should whoever, you should whoever, whoever wrote your IMDb profile needs to be sacked. No, they're always wrong. There's, look, first, <laughs> if anybody's interested about the reality of Hollywood, the first thing you read about me was wrong. Do not believe anything you read about anybody who works in Hollywood that's online because anybody could edit it. It's true. We should play a new game of like, how well does Andrew know Mike? And we'll just do a little ding tally every time. It's well, wrong it's, or right. Let's it, see. No, no, it's not fair to him. We've only met a couple of times, but but <laughs> it, it is interesting in that, you know, people will like go online to decide whether or not to hire somebody. And it's it's like based on what? This load of crap? I mean, I got to the point where I don't even edit my IMBD page. It, it's missing half my credits and some of the credits on there aren't mine. Well, hopefully we've got most of these credits right today. If anybody's watching the RA, we're going to go over this. But if anyone actually wants to see my real credits, go to, go to my webpage, mikedisa.net, and my resume's on there. You can actually look at what I've really done. Um, this wasn't, by the way, any a complaint about this podcast at all, but it is an insight into just how unreliable um, IMBD and Wikia is. And people treat it like gold, which is crazy. I don't know. It's really fascinating. Well, it's we get true. to kind of learn learn more about that in terms of like what's right, what isn't right, kind of the, the facts and myths about things like this. Now, this is yeah. the reason why on the shows that me and Steve do of Bodywood, uh, I keep telling him, don't go to IMDb for all of the facts about these movies and all of the trivia because they're going to be bullshit. Go to your audio commentaries, go to interviews, go to all of this stuff with the actual people who were there that at least are some credible source. And then we just bring Bill Daly in to just say, that's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. The audio commentary is scary too, though, because you remember those go past the executives and those get edited. Yeah. So, so I've done a lot of those. I've done a lot of special you know, features and, and, you know, like the stuff on the, on the back of Disney movies and stuff. And it's all bullshit. They would stage how we were drawing it and stuff like that. Even, even the basic production, you know, stuff was wrong <laughs> and fake. And I often get people, you know, like producers or, or people with money who want to break into Hollywood or people have been in Hollywood for a while, which is more terrifying, who like, you know, are talking to you about production 
talking about this and you you suddenly instantly know they're talking about they watched an extra they have no freaking idea how this really yeah. works <laughs> What kind of got you interested in the world of animation? So I was born in the south side of Chicago to two um, Chicago skid, uh, public school teachers. And we were not what you would call poor, but we certainly weren't what you call middle class. And uh, like I said, I grew up right by Marquette Park on 64th Street. And it was that area, um, Chicago land as it was called, uh, is was the murder capital of Chicago. <laughs> Um, it, I grew up surrounded by gangs and violence, um, old school gangs, you know, not, like, not like they are now. I wouldn't have survived there now. And it's still one of the most violent places in the world to grow up. I mean, obviously, not counting places America's bombed back to the Stone Age. Okay. Anything we've bombed back in the Stone Age is more violent than where I grew up. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but, um, but I grew up uh, in violence. Uh, when I, you know, my first memories are all based on violence. Um, walking to school was a, a gauntlet and uh, you had to find other people, other kids your own age or hopefully older kids and uh, perhaps older kids associated in some sort of informal club organization to keep you safe and alive <laughs> while you were you know, just trying to get to the grocery store to pick up the milk your mom sent you out to get. That's where I grew up. And uh, I was Roman Catholic, which means I went to the Catholic school mm -hmm. and uh Everything you've heard about the violence in Catholic schools is true. <laughs> so, you know, um, the, the classroom was one of the few places where there wasn't overt violence, but bathrooms were taking your life in your hands. Oh, uh, wow. The playground was certainly uh, Lord of the Flies. And, you know, walking to and from school was a great way to die. <laughs> Curious question based on that then, like growing up, did you know necessarily that you were growing up in a place of violence or because of your experience around you did you just assume that that's kind of the norm almost if that if that makes sense as a question joe that's a very insightful question and you're the first person to ever asked me that and that is nothing short of brilliant and let me tell you how i always explain growing up in chicago try to explain violence to me until i was in my 40s is like trying to explain water to a fish a fish can't see water. You can't explain to a fish that there's a place without water. He looks around and goes, what water? I don't see any water. <laughs> you, know, you take him out of the water, he can't function and dies. Yeah. But while they're in the water, they, you know, they, they function in it. They've developed fins and stuff. They can move through it. Well, that, that was what it's like growing up in violence. You learn skills to, to function in violence. And the people who didn't were victimized horribly. Yeah, or um, it shapes you in a way as you're growing up through it. Didn't realize it, though. I mm -hmm. mean, if you'd asked me then, I'd be like, what are you talking about? This is this is a great place to live. Look, there's the playground right down there. And yeah, only a couple of kids got shot last week. And, you know, there's the church. And, you know, that's where the priest beats me up after church. And then there's, the, there's that, you know, and on and on and on and on. Um, by the way, most of the priests were great and they were related to me. I have no problem with the Catholic Church. Anyways, the... Um, <laughs> Hashtag not all priests. Let's go. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Hashtag my uncle was a priest. He's fine. And it was the, uh, <laughs> but you know, my grandfather was a Chicago city cop. I mean, you know, and my uncles are firemen and stuff. I mean, you know, it was a manly environment. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. And it was, it wasn't like that because of, you know, what people like, you know, you know, everybody under 30 thinks that they, the world is exactly the way that they, that they experienced it, you know, throughout history. Um, that kind of strong male figures protected the family. And I mean, literally, you know, mm -hmm. my, my grandfather would come home from work with his knuckles busted because he was trying to keep people from hurting each other. He wasn't, you know, out just, you know, things may have changed. And I do get the feeling that authority is being misused differently than it was back in the day. Yeah. But where we grew up was very, very violent and also racist and sexist and horrible in every other way possible. But um, it was what it was. And I wouldn't have understood that. You could have, you know, had, you could have tried to explain this to me till I was, till you were blue in the face and I would not have understand it. It's not to say I wouldn't, I, I, I resisted the information. It just, you were talking about water to a fish. Yeah. Yeah. But that directly leads to my love of animation because what happened is my dad marvels me. Uh, I, I could tell you things about him and you would just be, my God, this guy's the same. He sounds like Clark Kent. You know, the, the stuff he did and how he held the family together through tragedy and nightmare and, and did it with, you know, such equanimity and grace and 
calmness and understated love. A, a tremendous guy. So I'm very lucky that I had him as a role model. Mm. But he was an artist. And, um, you know, he was an artist despite tremendous odds. You know, again, his father, you know, was connected to, was connected, let's just say that. And, you know, there was a lot of, the violence he experienced growing up was you know, 10 times what I experienced growing up. He had lost an eye and everything like that. And, uh, but he was an artist. And in order to support a family in Chicago on his own with no, no help from anybody, he became a high school art teacher. But he had this deep, passionate, mature, intelligent love of art. And he loved movies. And I wanted escape. Yeah. That was an eerie moment for that to happen. And um, <laughs> it's just that you know, I'm, I'm in this. Um, and what happened then is, is we would sit together in front of the TV uh, watching WGN on Sundays. And they would, you know, that was cartoons in the morning. And we both loved Warner Brothers cartoons. And he would sit there with me and, you know, we would bond over them and laugh at them and repeat them to each other. And we would then watch, you know, family classics. And, um, he would, you know, we'd watch classic old movies from the 30s and 40s and 50s. And then, you know, other movies would come on. Then we'd stay up late and watch The Late Show and we'd watch great westerns and the usual, you know, Disney stuff that at the time was, you know, poured on every kid. You know, it, it, you know, it was an event, you know, mm. back before we managed to make, you know, animated films, not just pointless, but annoying. Um, it was, it was a, you would take your families out to experience what you did as a child. And it was this innocent bonding experience that a family could do together. Mm -hmm. Not an opportunity to go be scolded in the, in the theaters. And so we had that, but my dad also was an artist and so he could draw and he had a deep love of drawing and, and the way it expressed himself was classic American illustrations. He loved clay and the type, but also, mm -hmm. um, newspaper comic strips. So we were big fans of Pogo and, and Kelvin and Hobbes. And as I was growing up, he and I would, would read these together. And when I grew up and became an, you know, came out here to be an animator, basically to fulfill what I thought was his dream, um, we would call each other up on Sundays and read each other the, the comic strips <laughs> <laughs> oh, so over the phone. So much. Yeah. Oh. And so, but my, my self-esteem was tied to my fists, not my brain, not my talent. And despite my dad trying to help me learn to draw and trying to point out, he, you know, he would point out history and we would read books about Da Vinci and Michelangelo and he would try to get me to think outside the box of Chicago. It was difficult, but um, I'd had this experience. And by the, at that point, I think I'd been stabbed three or four times. I mean, you know, it's not like death was a stranger to me, but uh, I'd had this one experience. And it happened exactly at the time when I was reading a book on an airplane about how Michelangelo was not the best art student in his class. When he was growing up, and I forget the name of the, the town he was originally from, he, uh, there was another guy who was better. You know, like, what we're, I'm going to call it art school. For those of you watching, of course I know it wasn't exactly an art school. I, I know how the Renaissance worked. But for, for, for the sake of the story, just go with this, okay? Because it, it was more complicated. But um, the, there was a better art student than him in his class. And um, when the Medici sent out the talent scouts to the towns like they used to do, they would meet with the best promising young apprentices. And um, the Medici agent who came to his town offered uh, an apprenticeship, and it's not quite what it was either, to um, the other kid. Right. And the other kid wouldn't leave. He liked his home. He had his family there. He had a girlfriend there. He had a future there. He had security there. He had all the things that people talk to you about to keep you from doing anything. He had all those dream-killing, warm, fuzzy, secure things that people who live and die and vanish from history all have wrapped around them. Yeah. And he stayed. And nobody remembers his name. The guy who wrote the book couldn't find out the guy's name. But Michelangelo said, fuck it, I'll go. And he went to the place he didn't want to go most in the world, which was Florence. And at the time, you think Sodom and Gomorrah was bad? Florence run by the Medici's? <laughs> it's another the, level. The, the, yeah, the road to Florence had the heads of their enemies on sticks that you had to ride past to get, you know, they had their own roads built, you know, in, you know, in the air, bridges, you know, so they wouldn't have to walk in the shit covered streets of other people and the crime and crime like that. You know, talk about, you think LA and, 
this and an is oligarchy the... and all that crap now is bad. You know, yeah. it's, trust me, it's not, we didn't invent it. We didn't invent it, TikTok. That, and, <laughs> that road was not paved with good intentions. No. Uh, <laughs> it's paved with in, good intestines. Anyways, he, um, <laughs> he went and he became Michelangelo. So one day, uh, my grandfather had died and left me his old Delta 88 Oldsmobile, which is this gigantic car. Um, we were very old at the time. And myself and another guy uh, threw our portfolios and one bag of clothes each in the trunk. I had about 150 bucks in my pocket plus gas money. And I drove to LA to be an artist. Absolutely awesome. awesome. It can happen. So to anybody watching this who thinks you can't, yes, you can. It's just a matter of will you. Did you have like lots of moments where you were almost like turning back around to be like, oh no, this isn't the life for me. Like I, or was it all kind of like, I need to get out of that life. I need to make something. No, it, it was drama. Uh, every Irish woman in my family, I come from a big Irish family, um, acted like I had just stabbed a baby in the face when I said I was going. As a matter of, you know, my mother wouldn't stop crying for weeks. I mean, every bit of manipulative bullshit you could pull to like, you know, keep a, keep a guy from not leaving the, the fold. As a matter of fact, I swear to God, my mom threw me awake two days before I left. And all the relatives <laughs> came over and the female relatives told me how nice it was to know me. As far back as I can look, and hopefully this is true, apparently one of your first kind of major jobs was working on Tasmania as an animation posing artist. Yes and no. I did have that job. It wasn't one of my first. Okay. Um, so when I first came out to LA, and again, if you're listening to this and you've got a dream and you're doubting yourself, it's not out of your reach. It's just going to suck. But if you're not willing to be miserable, then stop pretending you really want to do this and go off and have babies eat Cheetos, watch football and die like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was that too blunt? I was trying to no, crush it. Right. But, um, that was the same level as live, laugh, love, you know? Yeah. There you go. Live, laugh, love, die pointlessly. Um, the <laughs> When I first came out to LA, I was homeless. I wasn't good enough. I had not, because I decided to do this technically too late, um, I wasn't good enough. I didn't have the training. I didn't go to a good art school. I didn't go to a, a, a high school that would feed me into a good art school. I didn't go find a private art school. I didn't go to Cal Arts. I didn't go to uh, a Pasadena Design Center. I didn't go to, uh, you know, one of, the, you know, there's no place in the Midwest. I didn't even go to the best place in the Midwest, but I, I, I there's no place in the Midwest to go to train world-class artists. It just isn't. And um, so I came out here with this portfolio and I sucked. So I didn't find work. And so, and this is back in the days before the internet. And so like the way you found work was you went and you got, you know, the LA 411 published book that's published once a year. And you just start going down the, the lists of studios and production companies and stuff like that. And you just go knocking on doors and showing your portfolio. And it is an incredibly difficult process compared to what's going on now. So to everybody who's going through it right now, shut up. You got it easy. You punks. Anyways, we, we <laughs> the, uh, so I was homeless, um, lived on Venice Beach, homeless for a while. Uh, um, again, that's when growing up in violence does come in handy. But um, uh, eventually what happened is that even while I was doing this, I kept my eyes on the prize. And I think that's another thing I would like to say to anybody watching this if you have a dream. It's easy to get distracted. And you can be distracted by horrible circumstances and you feel totally justified in, into drifting away from your dream for survival. You can be distracted by abuse. You can be distracted by physical danger. You can be distracted by television. You can be distracted by sex and love. I mean, you can be distracted by media. Let it go. But the thing they all have in common is it's a distraction. If you're serious about pursuing your dream, then you have to get good at doing what you're saying to do. It's not enough to stand there and whine and demand that you deserve it. Nobody cares. Um, you're not entitled to anything. Nobody is. What you have to do is get good enough to be valuable to somebody, which means you have to work on your skills. You know, I know a lot of unemployed actors who don't act all day for free. Don't, don't go practice their craft. Don't get on stage. Don't work for free. Haven't joined a, a local community theater. Don't go for classes. I know a lot of writers 
who have one script and swear to God they should be writers that they keep going around while they watch football all day. Okay, a writer writes, um, an actor acts, an artist draws. So I started drawing caricatures on the beach and tried to keep drawing then. And then from there I was able to find uh, modeling classes. And um, eventually my portfolio got to the point where I was able to get a job. And the job was, it, it, I, I couldn't even describe it to you now because technology has changed so much, it wouldn't be relevant, but it was basically doing cleanup for $1.50 a frame at this digital wow. education company that was doing children's CDs. And it was a miracle to me. And, and the guy was the, the guy I came out here with because for $1.50 a frame, and some of these drawings were so bad that like, on a, on a good day, we made enough money to drive to Azusa, where we'd been staying because we, we ended up staying with this weird religious cult that was actually a sex cult. Azusa. Oh, oh, Azusa. Oh. Anyways, we, um, we, we were staying in this cult in Azusa and driving down to Santa Monica every day. And on a good day, we made enough gas money to go back. On a bad day, we slept in the parking lot. Um, but, and then eventually I got promoted to animator for no other reason than I was just the hardest working guy there, you know? <laughs> Who the hell wanted to go home? They just and, thought, they were like, he's been on that park bench one day too many. Let's try No, they didn't know. Oh, the other thing is never tell anybody. Oh. You know, I would like shower. I would like, I got good in bathing in sinks. You know, I, I would wash my, I mean, you wanted to look good. I mean, I wasn't destitute tested. I still had a little bit of money here and there because I knew how to thrift and stuff. But, and also I'd saved a little money. It, it, it's not, I don't want it to be a cartoon. Oh yeah, it sucked. But it wasn't like, I was like some crazy homeless guy in a shopping cart. It was, you know, you there are lots kind of, of you just learn to adapt to it, don't you? It just become your yeah. own day. It's it, it, homeless society is a society, and there are levels to it. And um, you know, just look at the, the ten cities outside the the court, the courts building outside of L.A. That's part of a system. Those people are families, and the reason they're camped around the court system is because they're cops there, and they want to be safe. So, like, there are there are stratas to this society. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Um, uh, I, I got promoted to being an animator. It was three dollars an hour, and that was three dollars a drawing, and that was a big deal because I was drawing faster, and it was to double the money, so we could start eating at Subway. And I got to tell you, man, that first Subway sandwich oh. <laughs> that was good. Dining at the it Palace. Was, it was turkey with every free thing they would put on it, man. I'm telling you, and <laughs> love that. I'm like, you know, like, like, do you want barbecue sauce, mustard, sauce, anything, everything you any if it has calories in it, I want it on that bread. Yep. And <laughs> and uh, and we do that. And from there, things got better. We got an apartment in uh, Azusa that eventually turned out was next to a crack house and the cops shot it up. And, you know, it, it, a number of things happened. But eventually I ended up um, working there and then starting to pick up freelance work around town. And this is another thing for people who are trying to break in and they don't have a way in. What you, in any profession you want to be a part of, there is a society that knows, that has the information you need. You know, go here, go there. This studio is hiring, that studio is hiring. This project is about to start up. This is what you're gonna to need to do it. I know the guy who runs that, that particular project. This is what he's looking for. That kind of information is not readily available. It, it's part of a society. So what you have to do is get into the society. And like any, every society has gatekeepers. For me, it was the ability to draw at a certain level and to be the student of a good enough teacher. And what happened was, is that I eventually, from kind of floating around the society and being nosy and asking people questions, I found out that most of the people who I respected and admired were trained by a guy named Glenn Vilku. Glenn Vilku is still alive, those of you who want to be artists, and he's still teaching and he teaches digitally. And this guy is the best artist on the planet right now. He's the yeah. greatest mannerist of this generation. And he teaches, and if you call yourself an artist and you haven't studied from him, you're like a you're like a musician who's never bothered to look at the works of Beethoven. You know, it doesn't have to be your favorite, but you have to understand him. So, anyways, Glenn, I, I you know, Glenn used to teach these classes at the zoo, and I showed up at the zoo with my portfolio, and I showed it to him, and I asked him to take me on as a student, and he was very sweet and very nice, but he's like, "You're so shitty, I can't help you, and I don't want to take your money," because he's a very kind man. So I stalked him and his students through the zoo for weeks. I would show up and follow them and stand behind them and try to live and draw the, draw, and eventually he took pity on me and he's took like, me as a student. I don't, I don't know this man. He's not left me alone. No, he, he kind of liked it. You know, he was a big guy. He's fought in World War II, Korea and stuff. He's he was like it. a regular guy. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, let him in. Yeah. 
And um, I eventually became uh, one of his students, and that eventually led to me getting my portfolio together, which eventually led to me becoming uh, taking more classes through the union, becoming more of a part of the community, and then eventually getting jobs like at Tasmania. Uh, what I was was a layout artist, a character layout artist. Yes, they do do the poses. And then eventually, you know, made friends with board artists and took classes and got to do boarding. So I, I did what a lot of people do when they're trying to break in the industry, which you float around picking up these low-end freelance jobs in the animation industry. This is again for the people who want to do this. If you want to, if you're not related to somebody in the field that you're dreaming of being in, you have to realize you're going to have to work your way in. And it's a little bit of a meritocracy, but more of it's just a bust your assocracy. You're going to have to bust your ass to get the one or two spots that open to you. And that means you're going to have to be persistent and you're going to have to be better than everybody else. And you're not born that way. You have to earn it. And you earn it by spending your time doing that instead of other shit that's more fun to do. And if you're not willing to do that, just in case you were wondering, you're full of shit. And you mentioned you started getting work in the field of films around this time. I think it was with uh, Universal. Uh, one of the movies is the cult classic Cool World. Uh, doing uh, effects animation. Uh, also, the big hit that was Casper for that year. <laughs> uh, th th those were those were in terms of my own personal life. It's interesting when you see your life written into a list, right? Because it it looks like yeah. it's progress and one thing led to another. Did completely different parts of my life. I'll tell you how I got the job in the Cool World, and you're gonna love this. <laughs> um, oh, I. One of the the time first time I saw what you would call adult indie animation, which has become my passion, was when I was in college, and uh, there was they used to show movies just randomly like they do, and uh, it was this movie I'd never heard of called Wizards, and it yeah. just was life changing for me. I I knew who Ralph Bakshi was, and I had heard that Ralph Bakshi was hiring uh, out of Burbank for this movie Cool World through the through the society. Remember, guys, you got to work your way into the society first. You got to. And I really wanted to go there. And so I uh, took my portfolio in, and all I'd done up to that point is character work. And they walked in and they were like, I'm sorry, I don't see it. all we've all the only room we have is for an effects artist. Have you ever done effects? No, no idea how effects even work. I'd never actually animated on paper. I never flipped paper. Anyway, so they said they they were leaving. And then as we're leaving, the, the receptionist or somebody, I don't know who it was, stopped me and said, Well, why don't you just sit there for a minute? Hold on a second made a phone call and, there. and then another person came up and looked at me and said, can I see your resume? And I looked at the resume. Now this is back when I had so few credits. I did something amateurish and stupid you shouldn't do. I listed my jobs that weren't in animation, which is just dumb. I've looked, I've, you know, that's just a great way of yelling the word, I don't know what I'm doing to somebody, right? But I listed jobs. And one of the jobs I had is I was a bouncer in a movie theater for midnight movies and I was a bouncer in a bar. And it's just, I don't know why I thought, it, I, I, I literally was just such a fool. I didn't know what I was doing. So I put these on my resume and the guy looks at it and he's like, you're a bouncer. I said, yeah. He says, stand up. And I stand up. He says, you're a pretty big guy. Can you handle yourself? I'm like, what are you talking about? I, I didn't know what, what, you know, what, what, what do you mean by handling yourself? He says, can you handle yourself in a fight? And I was like, are you, are you how, how, how oh. does, huh? yeah. How does one answer that question? <laughs> you know, it's like. Um, why don't you ask me if I'm good at stealing shit? No, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Anyways, it turned out that Ralph, who I respect as one of the great geniuses of all time, would more or less regularly get blackout drunk at, at lunch and come down and bother people after hours. That's all I'm going to say about the details of that. But he would come down blackout drunk and bother people. And what they were looking for was a couple of guys on the crew were big enough to get Ralph to his car. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> but Ralph, like I said, would be blackout drunk, but, but Ralph is also from New Jersey and Ralph is a big guy. And I can tell you this from experience, Ralph can throw a punch. So you can't just have like the big guy from Cal Arts who's like, you know, played polo, you know, <laughs> wrestle this guy into a car. You need somebody who can fight him. So uh, I got hired and they trained me to do effects, which, which opened the door to my life. 
as long as, you know, three days a week, I would stay later than anybody else. And when Ralph came down drunk, I would try to get him to his car. And when he, on the nights when he was so blind drunk, he'd, he'd cold cock me, I'd punch him back. And we would fist fight our way out to the car where I would eventually deck him hard enough to get him into the convertible and his girlfriend would drive him home. And he'd show up the next morning with no memory of what happened. That's so beautiful. That's so wonderful. <laughs> How often, what was the ratio of like successfully getting him in the car versus- Every time. No, my job was, it didn't matter. <laughs> No, there were some nights when it was easy and there were some <laughs> nights when like, you know, he knocked you down a bunch of times before you got him in there. But, um, and, and it didn't happen, you know, like I said, every time. So like, I would just, you know, I was on duty three nights a week and like, you know, a couple of times a month, you know, he would just really have a snoot full. So from there, I got like other jobs on other movies as an, as a low end effects artist in between her and then slowly became an effects artist and then transitioned from there into other things. But it, it, it really was my first time in film. And uh, what happens is people from that film, this is how it works, people from that film then, you know, when that film was over, went off into other jobs and the people who liked you, you know, mm. put in a good word for you. Did, did that merge you onto kind of like the world of Casper or was that a very different timeline? That was a very different thing and also a great story. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, 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 okay. If there's a lesson here, it's persistence pays off, but you're going to have to get lucky. Right. And... Uh, but one day we were going to lose the house and I was calling around and I, uh, I did this thing that I don't know if it still works or not, but I, I would call people up who I knew and I wouldn't let them off the phone until they gave me the number of somebody else to call, even if they weren't hiring. And I just did this all day. And eventually I got to, uh, somebody said, Phil Nibbling is, is running this show, this thing for Steven Spielberg. And he might be looking. And I really, the person didn't know if he was looking or not. I just wanted to be off the damn phone. So I called up Phil Nibbling and I started talking to him and I was clearly annoying him. He said, we're not hiring, we're not hiring, we're not hiring. And I said, I know, I know, I know, but blah, 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 blah. And, and I was just desperate. And at some point I threw out the name Glenn Vilpu, which I've told you about. And he'd studied with Glenn too. Again, this is why you join a community and you get yourself professionally trained because these connections pay off in ways you, you can't, you can't predict. Mm. You know, don't think you're being smart by not putting in effort or it's not worth it. You, you can't, you, you, you're not God. You can't see the future. Just fill your, fill your quiver with as many, bow, many arrows as possible. You, you won't use them all, but you never know. You'll fail. So, um, I talked myself into it, into meeting with him and I, it was on, it was in the universal lot. It was on the, it was the, the Casper was being done on the Amblin compound which was yep. the old Hitchcock compound. I mean, they had bridges and koi ponds. And it was this old rustic wooden thing that looked like it was right out of the 30s and big woods and gardens. It's where I met um, the composer of Star Wars and all that stuff. I thought he was the gardener. Oh, no. <laughs> I once offered to I, I thought he would walk around alone and compose in his head and you were supposed to leave him alone. I didn't know. I thought he was the gardener. So I kept going on then offering him half my bologna sandwich at lunch every time. And... He was such a nice guy. He'd just sit there with me, eat the bologna sandwich, and then go back to what he was doing. And finally, somebody was like, what the fuck are you doing bothering John? I was like, I'm sorry. I thought it was the gardener. I was giving him my... <laughs> anyway. The guy looked hungry. What could I do? I was like, I don't know. I didn't know. If he... I thought he looked like he was sad. I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, the... Um... So I, I go on this amazing thing, and you walk in the lobby, and there's like the spaceship from E.T., and there's the E.T. thing, like, and the Raiders of the Lost Ark whip and hat. I mean, it's you walk in here and you're like, I am, I am lost. I am in the wrong place. I do yeah. not belong here. All yeah. your insecurities come popping out. And I sat there for hours and finally, you know, Phil said he would see me. I mean, I must have sat there from like one in the afternoon to 5.30. And um, he finally calls me into this big room. And I imagine it as this auditorium sized room. I bet you it wasn't. I bet you it was pretty small. I was very nervous. Mm. And walked in and there were a whole bunch of people sitting around in chairs. And for some reason they were like lined up next to each other in chairs. And I'm pretty sure they were watching a presentation or somebody was pitching something on the wall. But of course at the time I didn't know all that work. So I probably just walked in. Yeah. So there's probably something going on. They just pulled me at the end of the meeting. And Phil, who I recognized because he always wore a scarf. No idea why. Not part of the story. But you can always know Phil Nibbling because no matter the weather, he's wearing a scarf. He thinks he's Doctor Who. I have no oh. idea. Great guy. Taught me a lot about intermission. But the scarf thing, I never had the guts to ask about. Anyways, um, he was the only guy there who didn't have a black beard, long, curly black hair, and a baseball hat. Literally, everybody else in the room was like that. More gray, less gray, more bald, less bald. But... Everybody was dressed in that uniform, except for Phil, the scarf and the blonde locks. 
So I went up to Phil and I, I, I'm, I'm going to act this out a little because it's funny. Feel free to edit it. But I, I'm with my portfolio and he says, hey, Mike, how are you doing? Mike, he says, well, how are you doing, Phil? It's great to meet you. I know all your stuff. It's been really, I really appreciate you taking the time. And he said, okay, but you know there's no job. I know there's no job, but I would really like you to look at my portfolio because not only would I like your opinion, but I really, really, really think someday you're going to want to work. And everybody's just sitting there staring at me. I'm like, <laughs> tunnel vision, right? Because you're desperate. <laughs> and I, I handed my portfolio and I started to go through it. Now, in the old days, oh, in the old days, kids, we used to have these portfolios that would unfold and they would have plastic in them and you'd have drawings, real drawings. You'd do with your hands. They'd be in there. It was the only copy of the drawings you had. I would lay it out and you would you would have to go. It, the, the book was kind of like a story. So you'd start with certain kind of stuff and you move on to certain kind of stuff and you talk a little bit about it. So he sat down there and I started to spiel. Okay, here we go. These are my quick set of drawings and my life set of drawings. I've studied with, as you know, Glenn Bilbo, these other artists, and I've worked with them. I, I, you know, I think I'm particularly strong in this kind of acting, this kind of work. I've done this. This is my professional work. This is this claim. And while I'm talking to Phil and I'm like staring at his eyes, I'm like, you know, love me, love me, love me. You know, it's like last call. And um, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing this. This guy next to him. Beard and baseball hat, long hair. Another one, yeah. Keeps grabbing this thing and looking at it, you know, doing this, and I'm like, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> "Excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Could I please? I just want to show this. Can I? Could I just get that back? Thank you, thank you. Okay, great. And there's this and that, and I like to flip, flip it over to stuff like that. And so I talk, talk like, to him, and then the it. guy would grab it again. I start to look at it. This is three times. I'm literally shitting my pants. And Phil thinks it's funny for some reason. And I don't care. I, I'm not even focusing on what's going on around me. So finally, I just turn to the guy and go, I'm sorry. Are you an animator? He looks at me and goes, no. I said, then give me that. And I put it, in, I talked about it. So you guys already know the end of the story, right? The guy ripped the portfolio out of was Steven Spielberg. That's and I didn't recognize him. That's bloody brilliant. What can I say? And... Everybody's smiling, and I'm not even noticing. It feels like it feels like that. And so he said like ten times, you know, we're not hiring. I'm like, I know you're not hiring, but I'm going to get good at this. I'm going to get better, and you're gonna hire me, and so, you're gonna be glad you did because I'm gonna work harder than anybody else. And I'm not asking for much. I just want the opportunity. And I said that to him. I would never have had the guts to say that to Steven Spielberg, right? <laughs> So Steve suddenly went from telling me there was no job and there must have been some sort of communication between Steve and everybody else, because obviously everybody thought this was hysterical, except for me. And he says, he, he eventually says, okay, what we'll do, Mike, is we'll give you a test, but there's no work here. There's no work here. I'm like, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. It's going to be great. All I want is a test. All I want is a test. He's like, but there's no work. Doesn't matter how well you do the test. Like, I understand. I'll have it for you tomorrow. Mike, it takes a week. It takes a week to do this test. Take a week. I'll have it for you tomorrow. Went home. Drove, drove, you know, you know, stayed up all night. I'm back at the Amblin lot at 9.30 the next morning. And I forgot to change my clothes. I cl I'm clearly wearing the same clothes. Yeah. Again, I don't know if that helped or not. Just painting the picture. So I sit there till like 1.30 or lunch or something like that. And out comes Phil and he's like, Mike, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm, it's done. He's like, it's not done. And so I walk in and he looks at me and goes, oh, okay. Well, it's done. It's pretty good. He goes through and he says, you know, this could have been better. That could have been better. But this is all really good stuff. You're pretty good. And I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And he's full on pause. like, but I told you there was no job here. And I'm like, I understand. I understand. But, That's the test. you know, and, and I forget even how we left it, but it was something along the lines of like, you know, I just wanted to do this. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Someday think of me. Okay. And, and that's how you got to end guys. Yeah, that's how you have to end. True. And you know, you, you want to keep the door open. Okay. Don't stay there until they have to call security. Yeah. So anyways, I get a call the next day from a, a woman in accounting. And she's like, I would like to offer you a, a position on the film. And uh, my wife's like, oh my God, I'm <laughs> and she's like, oh, thank God. She's like, and of course, this is, this is the first question my wife ever asked me about anything. How much are they paying you? Yeah. <laughs> like, hey, good, good job, job. I'm in a cage fight to the death with a lion. How much are they paying you? Would be her next <laughs> next question so you know i'm like i don't know i said i'm sorry i could i real quickly i'm sorry i, I what was the salary in that i just need to know and there she's like oh no problem and she quotes me a number <gasps> like four times more than i've ever made in my life 
<laughs> and at the end of it, she's like, "Would that be acceptable, or or, do, or or should I send you to um whoever it was to negotiate?" I'm like, "That would be fun." <laughs> like, no. Laura's like with big eyes, and I'm like, "I'm like, okay, great." And so like the next day, and I, I show up, and I'm working at Amblin with Steven Spielberg, and I, I won't get into this part of it, but. The reveal to me that this guy was Steven Spielberg was a huge setup they all did. And it was supposed to be very funny, except when they introduced me to Steven Spielberg, I still didn't recognize him. So he did not jump flop. Oh, no, Mike. What he had done is he made me a spot because he's a genuinely nice person. And he recognized that kind of enthusiasm and desperation. And that's another thing, guys. Never hide your enthusiasm. You're, I mean, you know, your best bet, the best thing that ever happened to you is you find somebody else in a position to help you who's worked their way up to and recognizes that yes. in you. Because, you know, we all want that. We all want the person yeah. who's like us on the inside, not the outside. So it was a good investment in yourself. Yeah. And, well, and by the way, he never got my name right twice. <laughs> He's like, hi, Mark. Hi, Melvin. You never got, you never got right twice. I never so... corrected him. <laughs> Thank God he notices me. Fine. <laughs> But it was a huge thing. But he he kind of he kind of spoiled me because you know um, uh, up to that point I'd only been exposed to animation, which is honestly, um, directors in animation aren't very good. Uh, and I tell you this as one: all they have to do is basically manage the story team, and everything else is pipeline. When I want, went off and I started doing my own films, I was very very different director than most people because I could manage my own pipeline, and I would call people on their bullshit, and I would. You know, um, I was a part of negotiating the deals to produce things because I, I had ex I had experience doing this and I knew how to do it and I I done the stuff. But for Stephen, it was it was awesome because now I let me come to dailies, but he let me come on the set a couple of times. I got to watch the camera set up and I started learning about live action. And when I and what happened was I was there for the day Amblin got not Amblin uh, DreamWorks got made because what happens we were all sitting around one day what, with the TV on drawing and we looked up and our boss was on TV with. Geffen and uh, Katzenberg announcing DreamWorks. And we we're all like, okay. do we still have jobs? <laughs> what the hell just happened? You know? <laughs> you know? And uh, the next day I came into work early and I used to be the first guy in the work to make the coffee and everything's been rearranged. There are people bustling around and there's this, you know, secretary bounces over to say, hi, you know, welcome to DreamWorks. Can I help you? Who are you here to see? And I'm like, I'm, I work here. I'm going to make coffee. Oh, no, come on in. You know, and she takes me over to the new espresso machines. Like, what kind of espresso do you want? I'm like, oh, I thought the guys would want something. And, you know, it was just really weird. And then with one, and then out comes, you know, little Jeffrey Katzenberg. And he's got, you know, his tie on and his sleeves rolled up, which is to this day the weirdest thing I've ever seen anybody dress. And he's like, hey, how you doing? I'm Jeffrey I'm Katzenberg. You know, I'm like, oh, hey, how you doing, Mr. Katzenberg? Call me Jeffrey. Call me Jeffrey. Okay, how you doing, Jeffrey? It's Good to meet you. It's like, so you work here. You're one of the team, huh? Where we're going to make hits. We're here to make hits, aren't we? Are we here to make hits? I'm like, we're here to make hits. <laughs> and um, at what point were you thinking this is like the weirdest fever <laughs> dream? Like, what? It, it was like, what's the trick and like, what's real? What the fuck's going on? You know? And then um, we got called into our first storyboard meeting with him, and he was like, we're in the business of making hits, making hits. Now, up to that point, when Stephen would talk to us, and he was very, very low key, and Stephen was very respectful for his work, it was always about cinema and the camera and the audience and how the audience, like how cutting is such a dramatic, you know, it's, it's such an abstract thing to do. And how film is an abstract person. What you have to do is connect somebody's point of view to a character. And then that character can walk through the scenes and those scenes all have points. I mean, when you're talking to Steven, you're talking to a filmmaker, you're talking to, to Jeffrey Katzenberg. I don't know who the fuck you're talking to. Cause all he does is sit around and go, we're going to make hits. You know, John's going to do our music. We're going to do hits. We're going to do hits. What a weird little man. <laughs> I mean, the guy revitalized Disney, so I guess he knew how to make animated films, right? He did, he did um, but the phrasing. And it was so off-putting to suddenly go from, you know, talking about cinema to talking about hits that I I left there and went to Disney Feature, and that's probably the beginning of where my CV is correct. Well, yeah, I mean, th this was the time here. You, you're you coming in kind of the tail end of what they called, like, the the Disney, well, the second Disney Renaissance or whatever they call the it. The resurgence. Yeah, resurgence, yeah. So... This is just yeah. after uh, the hit of The Lion King. So you come in around Pocahontas, I believe. And The Lion King, beginning yeah. of Pocahontas. So beginning of Pocahontas, right? Pocahontas mm -hmm. you stay all the way until Treasure Planet. Can oh, I no, just... No, genuinely, Treasure Planet was the animated film for me that changed my life. <laughs> that is my number one. 
that is influenced Mind every you? Run, Running through the gauntlet here, so obviously you have Pocahontas, you have the Hunchback of Notre Dame. It's Notre Dame! Which is one of, you know, I think that's one of the silent classics that they have. It doesn't get talked about as much as many other Disney movies. Uh, Hercules, Mulan, Tarzan, Fantasia 2000, which is also incredible. Uh, the Tigger movie, um, and little known fact, hello. <laughs> oh, um, there it is. Uh, Atlantis, The Lost Empire, and then Treasure Planet. Underrated. Very underrated. Underrated film. Yeah. All of these movies, you were there for. Two things uh, I realized as an artist doing it. First of all, which was um, Disney feature was a sweatshop. And that's just, people just have to stop getting upset when those of us who work there say that. They destroyed marriages and lives. It, it was not unusual to bring clothes on a Monday and then go home on a Wednesday or a Thursday. It, it, and then like turn around and do it again. We were in overtime for more time than we weren't. So, I mean, years at a time. And that's Saturday, Sundays, working till midnight every night. And it was brutal. And it was brutal. And often people ask, well, what's the difference between that and the, uh, the classic days? You know, the, the, the first one where, where you know, nobody talks about how brutal it was. As a matter of fact, they talk about how, how calm and great it was. Well, one of them was the, the time compression. But also the fact that the thing you have to understand about the resurgence of Disney is the people who were the lead animators and the, the directors who were usually promoted to work were not filmmakers. Walt Disney was a filmmaker. Um, and even when he handed the reins off to other people, they had been trained in this efficient way of making films. And by efficient, I mean creatively, not necessarily in terms of drawing. I don't mean cheap. Yeah. Put the money where you get the most bang for it. The people who were part of the resurgence, and remember, the resurgence wasn't artist generated. It was content generated. Yes. It was two people who came from Broadway with, you know, the, the book for Aladdin. Mm. Um, that was a big part of the resurgence. As, as you can tell, as the moment he died, the movies started spiraling very quickly. But they came out of CalArts, and CalArts, frankly, was a drawing school. It was a school that focused completely on drawing. That's why it was set up. Walt and those guys set it up because they needed people who could do this particular skill. You know, it, it's like an astronaut is not an engineer. Just because you can pilot the space shuttle doesn't mean you could build one. Yeah. And eventually these people were asked to build a space shuttle. Oh, and no. um, so what they could do were movies like The Great Mouse Detective. Structure laid on these films so that the yeah, every sequence had a point. And the music advanced the plot. And then what very quickly happened after that went away is you start to see the, the musical numbers just feel like they're tacked in. And the films feel a little more, they don't have quite the drive. And kind of the momentum kind of lost. And by the time we were doing stuff like Home on the Range, you, you have to understand these movies were, were already pretty dull. Yeah. And I'm not complaining about your childhood. Because there's this magical experience of watching drawings come to life that I think dies when you make it basically computer-aided puppetry. Um, there's something about the, that intimacy of a drawing looking like it's alive that, that has this perpetual 24 frame a second magic that it, it enraptures children and, and adults, and myself as well. And it, it's wonderful. But that carries you a lot. And, you know, when you, when you switch to something that's far more technical and colder, um, there's something missing yeah. and that missing makes you look, you know, notice things like, Oh wow, this story isn't well structured. And these songs are just stuck in the middle of nowhere. But so that, that's, so that, that's it. It's like it, the studio was clearly in the business by the time I got there of doing impressions of earlier films to the point where like the directors would talk about earlier films and like make it, make this scene like that scene, make this moment like that moment in the story room. It was this constant re regurgitating you know we'll make it more impressive we'll put more money on it we'll put a big camera move on it we'll get cg trees in tarzan but it wasn't like let's tell a different story or let's tell the story you know in a different way it was all flash on top of it and at first we didn't notice and i say we i don't mean the royal we of disney you know me and the guys in the basement drawing these things and we didn't notice because we were so swept away in the joy of being there but eventually some people, me, uh, at least, 
started actually looking at them like they were films. I, mean, I was like, why are, and they pitch you the film. And I'm like, why are we making the crappy version of Lion King again? Why are we doing the half-assed version of Aladdin? Why don't we yeah. do something else? Why don't we do, why don't we do a film that's about the film and then all struggle to the film, not struggle to do an impression of what used to make money. The best way to describe making a Disney film or any big budget Marvel film, I think that now for the Disney company is the best analogy is McDonald's. McDonald's is a great thing. Mm-hmm. Find me a child in the world who doesn't like McDonald's, right? McDonald's, it's great. It's perfect. It's it. No, but you can't go home and cook a McDonald's hamburger, right? You know, yeah. McDonald's is this unique, wonderful treat. It is a, it, and it's built from the ground up, this gigantic multi-million dollar machine. If you want to make a 39 cent McDonald's hamburger, you got to build a $3 billion franchise to like grow the meat and deforest South America <laughs> and you know, put, put the beef on there and, and grind stuff up and, and, you know, and build the franchises and build the machines and stuff like that. That's yeah. what it is. And of what we were, it occurred to me one day, is we were the guys who were hired to press the button on the shake machine. Okay. We had a skill. It was a very good skill, but it was only a good skill if you had this the shake machine to press. Oh, no. I, I want to excuse the pressure that these directors are under because I just said bad things about them. I don't want to. They, yeah. These were guys who like were really good McDonald's managers. Okay. But you can't, I mean, I guess you can leave McDonald's and go to Burger King, but pretend McDonald's was the only place doing it, okay? <laughs> it's a monopoly. It's a monopoly. Yeah, maybe you could go from McDonald's to Burger King, but you can't go from McDonald's to directing uh, a Mission Impossible movie. Brad Bird proved that, you know? Uh, and nobody's going to want you to anyways because you don't have the basic skill set. You don't know how cameras work. You don't know how lenses work. You don't know how to direct live action people. You don't know how to schedule things. You don't know how to budget your time. You don't know when to take good to good. So you've got to stay in your wheelhouse, which is the storyboarding animation world. But they started to get nervous. They started to get scared. And, you know, one of the things that's just true, you have to, when you look at those films, there's a reason why they didn't have kind of the impact of the earlier films, as, as, as passionate and wonderful as they were for so many people who grew up seeing them, yes. is the fact that we didn't spend five years making that film. We spent a year and a half making it three times. If you're doing shit over and over again, you're not, you know, it's not refining, it's going back just, you know, if, if all you know how to use is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So they kept going back to story instead of like, no, make the scene work. Direct they're it. Just, yeah, they're throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. And realistically, yeah. there's so much on the wall that you can't see what's underneath it anymore. Yeah. And then the executives are coming in and they're throwing out ideas, but they're not going to commit to anything because then they'll get fired. And so what happens is the machine took over. And this is what's destroying Marvel. This is why they scrap book movies when they shoot them now instead of shooting linear yeah. movies off finished scripts. Because yeah. nobody's responsible for that. That's what happened at Disney. Uh, eventually, that led to um, the films becoming, you know, the box office dropping at the same time the cost of the 2D animation was skyrocketing. And that, that led to the CG coming in. And the executives wanted that because you can train anybody to be a CG animator almost. You don't need to be able to draw. You don't need to understand movement, how the eye perceives pans versus walks and you know the difference between a transverse and a, and a rotary walk cycle and all that stuff because computers can do all that for you. You just need you, you just train really good operators. Well, I mean, I look, I do CG animation too. I've directed CG films. It's a very important skill set, but it's nothing like those what those old guys did. But every film had its joy and wonderful too, because it it really was a, a great honor, and we all knew it, to mm. be able to animate, to sit down and be handed a you know be talked about a character and, and handed a model sheet, and to be asked to bring it to life and know that people, children especially, but people are going to see this forever, and that every frame of this was important, and you had to do your absolute best at every second you were doing it, and um, it was it was disheartening when there were very well-paid animators who started crapping it out because they felt that they should be paid more or whatever. Last really celebrated animated movie around that time was Lilo and Stitch, and rightfully so, because I do love that movie. Yes. Yeah. And then every, Please, brilliant, every, brilliant. every animated movie after Chris that Sanders. dropped in kind of popularity. Well, I mean, Chris Sanders was the last director. Yeah. I mean, he directed it. He knew what he wanted it to be, and he directed it. The other ones, you know, the Lilo and Stitch cost a fraction of what the other films did. Yeah. For that reason alone, there was somebody telling you what he wanted. And then when you got it, we were done. We moved on to the next scene. You know, um, yeah. It, it, what it comes down to is, is the factory was churning out product instead of having somebody with an idea. And again, that's that's the Happy Meal. Right. Because Disney films at their peak, 
were a cultural phenomenon and children could, could drop into them in ways that we're never going to see again culturally, that you could go to, go to McDonald's and get the Happy Meals. You could go to the store and collect the baubles. You could lay in the sheets and wear the costume and you could just stay in this safe, warm, pristine fantasy world where you were okay. It didn't matter about what shit was going on in your life. That's why I like Warner Brothers cartoons. Nobody died yeah. when I yeah. was a kid in one of those films. You know, Bugs Bunny got hit with a steamroller and then got up. <laughs> you know, these were magical, safe places to be. Um, so, like, you know, it, it, they, they were spectacular, warm, wonderful places for children to go. They're no longer that. It was a magical time when kids could just envelop themselves in these safe, wonderful movies. And we all knew it. And, you know, even, even the... The people I disagreed with creatively, artistically, we all took the idea of the fact that kids are watching this very seriously. We would never slip a dirty joke in. We would never pull a family guy because it was like, no, this is for kids. This is for kids. You know, we all argued about, you know, how far we could push the violence and you know, where, how we could get laughs or not laughs and what we could do with the characters. And that was all individual people in the group trying to work it out. But nobody consider doing anything that a kid couldn't look at with a, you know, just be perfect. You, the idea, we used to say all the time, remember, kids are watching this without their parents. You know, yeah. and we would took that very seriously. And I I think that's another thing that they've lost. You're right, though. And we can definitely say that no kid, despite all of these problems that Disney have had, like, no kid, including myself or anyone that I knew, knew of any of these kind of hiccups or problems. So it just goes to show that it, the magic was kept in them regardless. Yeah, it was all family business, yeah. Yeah, the hard work, yeah. <laughs> the cog was tired, but the kids are but, like, yay. But eventually, just the economics of it, when we became more expensive than computers, we were dead. <laughs> Luckily, it does have kind of a happy story here, because you do uh, leave Disney to go to Warner Brothers, and uh, mm -hmm. you end up on Looney Tunes Back in Action, which uh, me and Bill Daly talk about all the time. He tells me stories about the shooting around the Warner Brothers studio there. Yeah, I've got a lot of stories about that, um, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many to tell? Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that it was originally a Jackie Chan vehicle, and Jackie Chan wanted to do this stunt where he ran down the Eiffel Tower. And he eventually did that in a later film. I think one of the Western ones. Yeah. Buddy Cop ones or something like that. Yeah. It, and, you know, and still it, it wasn't what he wanted, I'm sure, because it looked very Hollywood with lots of cuts and stuff. Um, and, but the idea was Jackie Chan was going to be, I read the original script, was a secret agent who was coming in. And eventually he basically recruited Daffy Duck. And, you know, the two of them were off to, and then Bugs was after him. And it was, it was a very different, I think, far superior movie than what was eventually made. Okay. Um, and what what eventually the script for the one that you saw was eventually produced and um, read that and, you know, there was still a couple of nice sequences in it, but it was clearly not the same. It, it varied. You couldn't even follow really the plot thread. But there's some great there was some great bits in there. I'll tell you a bit now that was in the original one that had us rolling when we okay. read it. Um, it was so like and it, there's a there's a bit like it in in the. Uh, <laughs> in the movie now but uh it's not nearly as graphic but but it, it, it's really good there was a bit where um uh they have to replace Daffy Duck and they get a live act live action actor which they do in the film now I think I think that made it in I know we shot it I don't remember if we made it and um he goes to replace Daffy Duck and he and Bugs do the classic you know duck season webbit season and the whole time Bugs is like I don't think we should shoot this I don't think we should shoot this I don't think we should shoot this and the director's like no no it'll be great it'll be great it'll be great and they go duck season webbit season duck season webbit season Duck season, fire, and and Elmer Fudd executes this actor on set. <laughs> I would love that. And he's just like traumatized with blood all over him. Like, Ooh! And eventually he becomes an insane villain. He goes nuts and becomes like a sociopath in the movie. Because wow, that's not a film. It was very, very funny. Um <laughs> I don't remember if that, I remember reading that and dying. I don't remember if it ended up in the film or the way it ended up in the film. But look, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, and this is just my opinion. Uh, mm. It never felt like Joe was particularly invested in that film. It, it felt like he was, you know, he had he had his heart set on doing a couple of jokes with the Batmobile and bringing in Roger Corman. And my big conflict with, you know, and and, and he, he brought in puppeteers, you know, uh, to, to film the live action. And 
I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Maybe in his day he was meticulous, but he wasn't. You know, I was on the set with him a lot. And the boards were done, were set up in such a way that Brandon Fraser, who's six foot four, and Bugs Bunny, who were four foot six, were framed so they could talk to each other. Well, when Joe was on set, you know, if he wanted to do a close up of Brandon Fraser, it's a bit difficult. He would tighten it up on Brandon Fraser, and then the puppet guy would stand up and get Bugs in the frame. And I remember I watched this for a while, and eventually Joe and I kind of got in a little tiff. And I was like, Joe, there are shots before that. We, we've got a we've got, we've got a two shot before it. We can see Bugs and Brandon together. You can't cut tight and suddenly have Bugs' head in there. <laughs> We're not going to be able to do that. That won't work for continuity. He told me to shut up, basically. And um, and then he, you know, there was another thing we were reviewing, and you know, the film wasn't working, and he and I had a conflict. I'm like. Why are we doing a 10 minute sequence with the Batmobile? So you can do your hysterical joke of having Roger Corman yell cut. Nobody in the planet knows what Roger Corman looks like. This joke <laughs> isn't going to work. There's like four guys who work for Roger Corman who are going to laugh at this. He, you know, shut up. Shut up. So like, I, I didn't agree with a lot of his decisions. And we did end up in that film, like having to like, you watch it and you're like, why is Bugs Bunny constantly climbing up Brendan Fraser and jumping down and, boom, and sticking his head and stuff like that? And it was, you know, Eric desperately trying to make the plates that had been shot make sense. So there was, it was a lot of effort. I, I didn't think Joe was particularly into it. I could be totally wrong. It could have been his passion project. And I'm sure if you asked him, he'd tell you he gave it 100%. Yeah. Um, it was my only contact with him, but it was a monumentally stupid film in a lot of ways. It had some really neat ideas for sequences and then was taped together. And it was not a Bugs Bunny movie. Yeah. And at the end, the the ending that we had set up hadn't quite worked. And so they brought in a very famous storyboard artist who I work with all the time and who I know very well, so I'm not going to say his name. And he mm -hmm. came in and he he, he pitched the, uh, the new ending, which was suddenly they were going to go to space and Duck Dodgers was going to show up. And it's like, how, how the fuck does like anything emotionally we've set up build to this? So... Yeah. That's like I know. However, movie. I got to animate a lot of Duck Dodgers, so I was happy because I love <laughs> animating Duck Dodgers. I love Duck Dodgers, though. I love, love, love. Oh no! Them. And so, like, I, you know, they, they're, you know, we fought it, we fought it. We, me and Jeff, we fought it, fought it, fought it, fought it. And then, so we're doing Duck Dodgers, and Jeff and I were like, "Great, we'll animate Duck Dodgers." You know, at a certain point, you're gonna be like, "Hey, okay, let's let's just do our best." You know, that scene where um, Duck, Duck Dodgers keeps blowing himself up, I got to do that. And that was as happy as I've ever, that's as happy as, a, I, that's as close as I'm ever going to get to animating Warners in the 40s. You know, I, I really, really enjoyed that. At the end of that movie, they were doing a, uh, they were taking bets on what the, what the thing was going to make. And it was amazing because most of us, I think, knew it was a piece of crap. <laughs> and yeah. Expensive piece of crap that we killed ourselves on, but the animation team can't solve bad filmmaking. And, um, you know, there, there were all these bets on what it was going to make. And you know, I'm looking at it and some people were just delusional. I ended up winning that pool and never went to collect the money because everybody was so pissed at me because I picked a number so low that people were mad at me that I picked it. And yeah, I they were like, there's no way. It was bad. We could tell because when we're watching it and we're the people most attached to it, we would get bored and drift away. You know, while watching the screenings, the animators weren't watching their own animation. That's how bored we were. Um. But it was a great opportunity for me because I got to do things like I, I worked, you know, I, I got to jury rig the cameras that we were shooting stuff with. I got to solve technical problems because there wasn't any support staff. It wasn't like Disney at all. But basically it killed the, anima the animation division at Warner's. Uh, so I was asked to hang out there and develop a couple other projects, but it, it was over at that point. You know, every like seven years, Warner Brothers puts together a fe feature department and then blows it to pieces with bad management. They just did it again recently with Scoob. Got um, a lot more trauma for everybody. Come on, get just, on the train. Eh, it pays for people's houses. I mean, nobody, you know, I'm working animators don't give a crap. It's like, you want to make crap? Make crap. I'm going to still draw well. You pay me for and, it. But um, I got to do development. And after that, it just it, it just was the inevitable the inevitability of moving out of storyboard into writing and show running my own stuff. And so I did a series of shorts for Warners. I did some short for Disney for Lilo and Stitch. I did some, I did some stuff to prove I can do it. And then I got hired to start doing movies. Well, this has been a fantastic first part of our journey with Mike Disa. We have learned things that we've probably never heard before from anywhere else. And uh, we've got so much more coming up. We are going to do it on us part two, which is going to be coming in two weeks time. Um, 
I just want to say thank you very much to Mike for joining us. And thank you very much to Joe for managing to stay awake when she's getting up in about four hours. I would also like to thank you for staying awake. I mean, the conversation was so fantastic. I, I'm I'm wide awake now for the next three hours. I'm going to be sat there lying in bed being like, Treasure Planet was a piece of shit, huh? No, I mean, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking, I mean. I'm joking, I'm joking. But let me give it to you childhood. I'm telling you how it was made. Now, you know. I, got, I got you. Don't worry. Don't worry. I understand. Well, part two, we are going <laughs> no, to be talking that. about Dante's Inferno, Dead Space Aftermath, Hoodwink 2, even Postman Pat the movie as well as Wacky Races, The Simpsons, Paradise PD. We've got it all coming up. And we all want to know all stories that we don't. Get access to general. And Mike is the man to tell us about it. So that's coming up. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we just want to do uh, our regular sign out here. Say thank you for joining us on Partywood. And the most important thing is, guys, come on. We need those subscriptions here on YouTube because it helps us to grow. What it takes for you? Two seconds. Click of a button doesn't change your life at all. But for us, it does, because it gives us a, a larger audience and more people being able to see the show like you good people. So give us a hit on the uh, subscription button down there. Thank you very much. Uh, so again, uh, thank you, Joe. Of course, thank you, Mike, for joining us this week also. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Uh, so yes, uh, as always, uh, if you want to get involved in the conversation with Pottywood, you can join us on our official Facebook page. You can join us on Twi Twix, Twitter X, whatever he's, whatever okay. he's calling it this week. You know, whatever, whatever sign he's going to get pulled off his building by the time this episode goes out, whatever it's going to be. Uh, what a doofus. Um, also, uh, if you're more intellectually based and business boss bitch, as uh, Joe would say, you can find us on LinkedIn. Um, we might even be the only podcast on LinkedIn. Bizarre. Um, and also you can find us on Instagram and all the other places. And our subreddit is back as well. Uh, also, Joe, we have a Patreon, don't we? Yes, we do. So we've got a, a Patreon. It is live. It's ready for you all to come in and donate. So we've got extra episodes of After Dark set to lovely jazz music. We're going to have kind of previews being put on there. So please get involved. It would be great. And it really helps us to grow the show. Price of a cup of coffee a month. Until next week, uh, where it's going to be me and Steve. Uh, we will see you again soon. See you soon. Take care.